Hey everyone, and welcome to Journey Church Online. We are so glad that you decided to join us today, and we are excited to see what the Lord is gonna do in your home and in your heart and in your mind as he seeks to transform us, to make us more like him. And we get to worship today through singing. We get to take communion today as a church family, and Pastor Matt has a timely word for us as we continue to walk in this season. But before we dive into all that, we have a few important announcements that we need to make. Yes, we do. And the question that is on everyone's mind is, when can we get back together? When can we start to gather again? Well, I have to tell you, we have put a ton of prayer into this. We've gotten some great counsel from our denomination, and we have set a target date for Sunday, June 7th. That's the game plan. And we know that this is a very fluid situation, but we are setting our target for June 7th. We've got a lot of work to do before we can come back and we need your help. One of the things that we need desperately is cleaning supplies. We need Clorox wipes, we need Lysol, and we need hand sanitizer. And so if you're out and about in town and you come across some of those rare and priceless commodities, if you would pick some up for us and bring them by the church, we would so greatly appreciate that. The other thing is if you like to sew masks, we would like to have tons of masks available here for anyone who'd be more comfortable wearing a mask and if they might need one. And so if you'd be willing to sew some masks for us and donate those to the church in the next couple of weeks, we would appreciate that as well. It looks like we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're hopeful that that's the case. And so we're, we're putting our hope and setting our target for Sunday, June 7th. Yeah, it is, it's so exciting that even that date is on the horizon, that we might be able to get back together again soon. And just so you know, there will be more information coming about what that's all going to look like in the days ahead. But also, we have a few other things that we need to highlight, and one of those is an important new tool that we want to use together as a church family. And over the last few months, Pastor Roly has been working on a church app for us. And so if you have a smartphone, you can find our brand new app in the Google Play Store or in the Apple Store. If, as long as you type in Journey Church Kingman, you'll be able to find that. You, on that app, you'll be able to find the daily doses, sermons, a spot to put in prayer requests, find announcements. It's going to be an incredible tool for us to use in the days ahead. Without a doubt. And thank you, Pastor Roly, for your hard work on that. Before we transition to worship, I just want to thank you uh, for, your, for your giving and your faithfulness in that. We've hung in there during this shutdown season, but the last two weeks, we didn't just meet budget. Somehow we exceeded budget, which just blew me away. Although I'm not that surprised with our church because you guys love to invest in the kingdom, but I want to thank you. Your determination to give is inspiring and I'm so proud of the work that you guys are doing in that department. There are two simple ways that you can give. The first is just to throw a check in the mail to the church, and the other is to go to journeykingman.com and click on the Give tab up in the upper right-hand corner, and it's pretty self-explanatory from there. But it's so exciting for me to know as we're going to be moving forward into 2020 that we are going to be able to sustain the ministry that we care about, which is reaching Kingman with the good news. So thank you for that. Let's pray, and then we can dive into worship. Lord, there is hope today for us. We can feel it rising, and our hope isn't just in the fact that we might be able to gather soon. Our hope isn't just in the fact that the giving is, is going surprisingly well right now. Lord, our hope is in you, period. In good seasons or bad seasons, you are the reason we have to be filled with hope and filled with joy and filled with with confidence. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would take wherever it is that we're watching this service today, that we would participate in it, and Lord, that you would make where we're at holy ground. If we're watching with friends and family, Lord, may it be a special time for us to worship you together. And Lord, I pray that you would change us through this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Happy Sunday. We are glad that you were able to join us online. It's hard to believe this is our ninth week. And even though this is not ideal, I'm grateful that we have an opportunity to worship God no matter where we find ourselves. And I hope this morning uh, that you are in the mood to worship, that you are in a, a place where you are ready to receive the Holy Spirit, to be ministered by him. And so I want to invite you to stand um, or sit if you feel led to do that. But definitely turn up your radio, turn up the TV, and we encourage you to worship with us this morning. No other hiding place. I hope 
give you control Consume me from the inside out Lord, let justice and praise Become my embrace To love you from the inside out Everlasting, your light will shine When all else fades, never ending Your glory goes beyond all fame And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out, Lord, my soul. I give you control Consume me from the inside out Lord, let justice and praise Become my embrace To love you from the inside out Everlasting, your light will shine when all Your glory goes beyond all fame And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out Lord, my soul cries out from the inside out Lord, my soul cries out Well, today we get to celebrate and participate in communion as the family of God. And communion is for anyone who has put their faith and trust in Jesus. And it's a chance for us to remember and reflect upon the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf, where we think about the body that was broken and the blood that was shed. And so if you have your elements with you right now, wonderful. If you don't, maybe pause the video and go grab them. And again, don't worry if you, if you don't have grape juice and bread or a cracker, whatever you have is gonna work because they're just symbols for us to remember and to reflect. But in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he says something really profound to them. He says, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You see, Paul could have come to them with so many different doctrines and different thoughts and, and different ways of doing ministry to try and reach them. But he knew that the most important thing above anything else was to fixate and focus on Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was his desire. That was his focus. That was the entire goal of his entire life is that he would know Christ and that he would make him known. And for us, no matter what season you might find yourself in or, or whatever's going on in your life or whatever season we might find ourselves in collectively, we can be distracted by so many different things. But for us as a Christian, we should have the same desire and focus of Paul that we would desire to know nothing more than Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so today, as we celebrate communion, it's a chance for us to really put our eyes back on that, to fixate on not just the basics, but the only essential part of our faith. There are lots of great, important things, but really the only essential message in all of human history is that Jesus came, lived a perfect life, died, took on our sin and shame and the entire wrath of God, and then rose victoriously over the grave. And that's what we get to celebrate in communion. 1 Peter 3.18 says that Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, 
that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. You see, we are the unrighteous who didn't deserve the righteous one going and giving up his life for us. In the song that we just sang, it it was us saying that we've failed maybe a thousand times, but his mercy still remains. And the call for us is to go before him, to give up any control that we might think we have, to lay down our sins, our struggles, our burdens, our pains, right down at his feet and ask for him to change us, to transform us from the inside out. That's what we're hoping for every time we come to him. And so at this time, before we take communion, it's a chance for us to come before him and to confess our sins just silently before the Lord and ask him once again to forgive us and to take up those burdens once again on our behalf. So take a moment and be with the Lord before we partake in communion. Jesus, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your willingness to come and to take our place, the righteous for the unrighteous, that you suffered for our sins so that you could bring us to God. You were put to death in the flesh, but you were made alive in the spirit. And we celebrate that today. Lord, forgive us once again purify our hearts and minds. In your name we pray. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it with his disciples. And and he said, do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. So church family, let's take and remember Christ's body that was broken for us. And on the same night, He took the cup and he poured it out and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And so again, family, let's take and drink, remembering Christ's blood that was shed for us. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your body that was broken and your blood that was shed. Lord, help us to come to the altar where you offer forgiveness, where you offer love, where you offer mercy and grace. Jesus, you are above all, and it's you alone that we worship. In your name we pray, amen. Let's reflect with a song of worship. Jesus 
Father God, we thank you that you are our, our treasure. God, that you came for us, for sinners like me. We don't deserve the gift that you have given us, God. We are so grateful for it. God, thank you that you love all of us, no matter what our past may have been. God, you have wiped that clean forgiveness of our sins because of the work of your son on the cross. God, we thank you. Lord, I pray that you would continue to lead us, to guide us, to minister to us. Lord, as we just celebrate a communion, Lord, I pray that we would continue to celebrate the way that you are leading and guiding us. Lord, as we dig deeper into your word, learn about your love, learn about how you accept us with open arms, God. I pray that you would guide us. You would fill us, or you would help us to see the ways that we help others and know about the good news of your son. Help us to share the treasure that we have. I thank you for your love and for your mercy. In your son's name that we pray. Amen. I grew up liking school. And I know for some of you that was going to make me weird. 
but both of my parents were teachers. And so I'm sure they sent me out every day to school with a good attitude. And with the exception of a few grades where I had some mean old trolls for teachers, I thought school was pretty cool. I liked art class, I liked story time, I liked library. Like all kids, I liked lunch and recess. And I also liked PE. In elementary school, PE was usually like organized kickball or the entire group playing with a parachute. It was very simple and it was always safe. But middle school PE, on the other hand, was a lot different. The middle school PE coaches that we had, they loved to watch us play a game called Bombardamin. And so we played Bombardamin a lot. Bombardamin is just a fancy name for dodgeball. And I'm sure a lot of you can remember playing dodgeball in PE growing up. Some of you are still traumatized by it. The PE teacher would choose sides. He'd throw a bunch of volleyballs out on the small basketball court and he would blow his whistle. Well, I love playing dodgeballs. And over the years, we would develop strategies. And one of the best strategies is to try to gather four or five of the dodgeballs. And then you and your teammates pick one person and you all throw at that one person at the same time. And you do that because they're less likely to catch your throw and get you out. And you're very likely to knock them out of the game. There were several times where I was the only player left on my side of the court. And in those moments, I, I knew why our coaches called the game Bombardamin, because five or six volleyballs would be hurtling towards me at 100 miles an hour, and I would duck and I would jump and I would try to roll out of the way, but no one could really survive more than one bombardment. It was so exciting to see one guy against five or six ducking and dodging. And, and when they would get away from it, when they wouldn't get hit, we would all cheer. Those dodgeballs would just slam against the dark brick wall behind them. I tell that story because that's what the last few months have felt like for us. Headlines have been like flying dodgeballs. You dodge one and another one comes completely out of the other side and you didn't even see it coming. And a lot of time they're contradicting one another. And under this kind of bombardment, it's hard to make sense of what's really going on. And, and you can almost get into the point where your survival is your only goal. I'm just going to get through this season and hopefully it ends soon. But what's really going on is the enemy is shelling us. He's trying to get us distracted. He is throwing all these headlines at us so that we will become distracted from what our mission is. I'll admit he's taken me on a ride. He's actually taken me on ride after ride of informational and emotional roller coaster, right? Where I've had a lot of ups, I've had plenty of downs, and a lot of times I've had consistent loop-de-loops. And in those few moments of pause, all I can do is ask, what in the world is going on here? The last two months have been fun times, haven't they? Fun times. At last, I'm seeing things now with crystal clarity. Church, it's not about the virus. It's not about the economy. It's not about the upcoming election. And as much as we might miss it, it's not even about returning to some semblance of normal. These are all distractions. The only thing that the Holy Spirit is concerned about for us is fulfilling our mission. If you're like me, you've probably been guilty over the last few weeks of taking your eye off the target at times and worrying more about the headlines and the things that we're hearing and seeing and we're afraid of than we have been worried about our mission. We are on the earth right now to win spiritual battles. We are on the earth right now to be in a love relationship with God, to grow ever closer to him, and to love our neighbors well. The circumstances of our life are going to keep changing. Even when we get through this season, guess what? There's going to be some other season in life that's going to be hard and challenging and distracting. Right now, we're all annoyed 
with our circumstances. We're all frustrated. We're even getting angry. And those emotions are just coping emotions to help us deal with our anxiety and our fear. And I run into people all the time who say, I'm not afraid, um, but I don't believe them because right now most people are either afraid of the actual virus, they've got a health condition where they know if they got it, they're gone kind of deal. And then there's a whole other group of people who are afraid and anxious about what's happening in our country. And they're worrying that the cure is gonna be worse than the disease and, and they're watching civil liberties come under fire all over our country. And so they, even though they say they're not afraid, they are at least very much concerned and anxious about the things going on in our country. This season is awful. It's tough because it's forcing us to realize that we are not in control. We are not in control. Have you had your eye on the mission over these last eight weeks? Or have you exhausted yourself worrying about all these dodgeball headlines that have been bombarding you? Here's how you can test yourself to see if you've been on target or not. Are you closer to Jesus right now than you were eight weeks ago? Whether our, the doors of our building are open or not shouldn't matter. Are you closer to Jesus today than you were eight weeks ago? And the second part of this is, have you shared the good news with anyone? Let the world storm. Let the world quake. The only one to fear is God. And if we have our eyes and our life on his mission, we have nothing to fear. Now, I feel like the fever of this season is beginning to break. Let's get back to living for our mission. Even if we've kind of made some mistakes and been distracted and upset and, and totally sidelined so far, let's get back to living on our missions. You know, our reactions to this, our reaction to the last eight or nine weeks shows us a pretty scary reality. And that reality is that for a lot of us, with our normal being threatened in the way that it's been threatened, it, it shows us that we have treated this world like it's our home. And when our home gets all messed up, we get pretty messed up. But in reality, this world is not our home. It's not. This world is just our mission field. And we need to complete the work that God has called us to complete so we can go home to glory and eternal life and never-ending joy. Our scripture today is perfectly designed to get us back on target. We are already on part three of our new series called Scandalous Jesus. Jesus was not a stranger to controversy. In many ways, his actions and his teachings were considered scandalous. And I think it'd be helpful to review that definition once again. Scandalous is defined as unconventional conduct that goes against the expectations or rules of a community. Under that definition, Jesus was constantly a scandal to the religious leaders. He was constantly leaving them in shock. But the closer you look at Jesus, the more you realize what he's actually doing. And it's not scandalous. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. If you want to understand Jesus, it's surprisingly easy. All you have to do is understand his core motive for everything, which is always pure, perfect, passionate love for people. That is his core motive. What scandalous thing is Jesus up to today? Well, it's something that we really need to copy. We're in Matthew 9, starting with verse 9 today. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, 
not sacrifice. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I'm excited to talk about my namesake today. Keep in mind that what we just read is a little autobiographical. Matthew, who we're reading about, wrote this gospel, and these five humble verses are his story. Life in the days of Jesus was really tough, and I don't think I can overemphasize that. Rome conquered Israel, and to keep control, they kept their their boot on the Jewish neck. They weren't living in a democracy. The Romans even built an army fortress right next to the temple. Can you imagine coming to church and having to walk by Navy SEALs fully decked out for war and they were glaring at you because they hate your guts? I mean, we can't imagine what that would feel like, right? Because we have never lived under that kind of system. What made life really hard for the Jews, really difficult and really unfair was the tax situation. Governments require money. And to be more specific about that, governments require our money and lots of it, right? The Jews were taxed to death. Rome was constantly expanding and Rome was constantly at war. They had gigantic standing armies on multiple fronts. And and to fund that, they taxed everyone they conquered. And so the Jews were taxed to death. This is where Matthew enters the story. This is where he comes to play. Matthew was a Jew who, for whatever reason, he sold out his own people. He was a traitor in every sense of the word. Why? Why did he make his life choices? Well, maybe he was a realist. Maybe he looked at the power of Rome and saw how conquered they were, and he thought to himself, well, I can either be taxed to death, or I could be the one doing the taxing. That opportunism, unfortunately, made him a pariah to his own people. Based on his lifestyle choices, it doesn't look like Matthew loved God. But what we can see clearly from his life is that there was one thing he loved above all else, money. Matthew loved money. And so maybe at least in some ways, we all can find at least a level we can relate to Matthew. Matthew paid a lot of money for the right to be the one who collected all of the taxes in a specific territory. Once he acquired that territory through a gigantic payment to the Roman governments out of his own pocket, Matthew set the tax rates for the territory he was over, and he set them high. The people were buckling under the burdens Matthew was putting on them. Matthew would give to the Romans what they required, what they asked for, and he kept all of the excess. He kept all of the rest for himself. He was loaded while all the rest of his Jewish brothers and sisters were suffering from poverty. Matthew's love of money made him rich, but it cost him dearly in the things that matter. He was hated by his community. He didn't have any good friends. In public, he probably had to have a Roman guard follow him around to protect him. Because if someone in that day had killed Matthew, the entire uh, population would have thought that person was a hero. This is what it cost Matthew to give his life to money. This is where we find Matthew in the text. He was figuring out what so many rich people realize when they make it to the top of the mountain. Money cannot satisfy your soul. It can't even come close. And I also want to encourage you, if you are not loaded, if you are not rich, to not envy the rich. Because at the top of that mountain, there is actually nothing that brings soul satisfaction. So don't be jealous of the wealthy. Don't fall for that trap. Money can't satisfy your soul. Matthew's bank account was full, but his soul was bone dry. 
He made his bed. He made his choices. He has to lie in it now. My namesake was in a pretty sad and pitiful state. And then one day, Jesus comes into his life. Matthew, without a doubt, had heard of Jesus. You know how in our world, you can't go anywhere for three seconds and not hear the word corona or COVID? That was what it was like in Jesus' day, except his name was what everyone was talking about. It. Everyone had heard of Jesus. We don't get many details. We don't know what was actually going on in Matthew's heart in that moment. But when Jesus stopped by, his tax collection booth, which is a very shameful business, right? Matthew was forever changed after that encounter. Jesus gave Matthew an invitation. He said, join me. Join me in my great mission. Live for what matters. Do something with your life that, that's bigger than just trying to make money. Follow me, Matthew. Follow me. Let me lead you down a different and much better path. Matthew, this notorious sinner, leaves what he has invested his entire life in. And he becomes one of Jesus' most devoted disciples. And he writes the gospel of Matthew. He becomes one of the 12. He gets to live and have a front row seat of what Jesus is doing. He saw the light he never looked back. He had found the real treasure. He had found true wealth, which is the love of God. To celebrate, Matthew throws this big, epic party. And there's real joy here. His soul has found what it's always been looking for. And what a scene as Matthew calls together his old collection of friends, a notorious group of sinful people, and other evil, traitorous tax collectors. At that dinner party, you see that old Matt was running with a pretty rough crowd. Can you see this dinner party, though? Matthew aglow with new life and joy. His friends are in shock. They're in shock, but they're also filled with curiosity and with awe for Jesus, who is talking with them. And, and do you know what it must have felt like for those tax collectors who were hated by everyone? to experience the unconditional love, that selfless love, that, that love of Jesus, to come near that kind of love. I mean, these sinners were drawn to Jesus like a moth is, is drawn to a flame. While all of this is going on, not far off, the Pharisees are standing together and they're watching. Their necks were probably sore because they were shaking them in disgust the entire time. In their minds, Jesus is doing something wrong. He is associating with bad, bad people. Who would hang out with criminals like that? People who've been who betrayed their whole nation. The word Pharisee literally means the separate ones. They were separated. To their core, they strove to be different from the world. And anyone who didn't live up to their extreme standard were looked down upon. At this time, it was illegal for a, a God-loving Jewish person to associate with any kind of sinner or tax collector. Guilt by association. If, they just, if they, people saw you with a tax collector, they would assume that you were in, in cahoots with them. You could be excommunicated from the synagogue, which was the, cent, the center of Jewish life. Good people should not be spending time with bad people, right? Right? Here is the scandal of Jesus this week. Are you ready for it? Jesus had the nerve to care for lost people. Jesus had the nerve to care for people who were kind of rough around the edges. Jesus had the nerve to care for people who made really, really bad choices and did really really bad things. Jesus still saw them as valuable, sons of his father, and worth pursuing. Matthew's celebrating with his friends. He's been rescued from the fires of hell. He was lost, and now he's found. But the Pharisees aren't celebrating with him. They are scandalized. 
they asked the disciples, hey guys, what's up? Why does Jesus give those kinds of people the time of day? Why does he waste his time on people like that? It, it doesn't seem right. Something's a little fishy there. They're so clueless. And Jesus doesn't let the disciples defend him. He speaks for himself. He says, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. He says, God desires mercy more than he desires your sacrifices. The message of Jesus is this. Here, here, he, here we see the mission. He says, I am on a mission. I am here to call sinners home, to, to lead them out of that lifestyle that brings them death. My little brothers and my little sisters are lost. They're drowning. They don't know the way home. And so the whole reason I'm here is to save them, to pull them out of those pits. I expect uh, every time the Pharisees make an appearance in our series that the result is going to be the same. The true scandal is not going to be in what Jesus is doing. His grace is scandalous in the most beautiful way. No, the true scandal is always going to be the ugly, cold, unloving hearts of the Pharisees. Jesus came for the lost, period. He doesn't worry about perfect sacrifices, following hundreds of rules. He just cares about the people. My dear, dear Journey Church, there are Matthews out there right now. There are Matthews in your world, notorious sinners, lost people, people who don't know the way home. Our mission is to reach them for Jesus. I've thought about this many times, and I've said it many times at the front of our stage. If you want to follow Jesus, be prepared, because he's going to lead you straight to people. Do you know where Jesus wants to lead you in this season? He wants to lead you straight to a Matthew. Jesus won't lead you to a safe religious place. He's not leading you to hide under your bed. He's not going to hand, hand you a bushel basket at work and say, lay low, take it easy. That's not what he's about. And this leads us all the way back to where we started keeping our eye on the target no matter what is going on in our world, no matter what season of life we're in. Do you guys know that the church isn't on pause right now? Our building's not going to be open for a couple more weeks, but if the church is on pause right now, just waiting for worship services to begin, I think we should weep when we get back together and not celebrate. If we think the church is on hold right now until we can gather again on a Sunday morning in our building, we actually have some repenting to do. The goal of the church, the mission of the church is to reach the lost. We wanna help you become disciples who will then turn around and make more disciples. Since when did we need this sanctuary to love our friends? to reach our neighbors, to care for someone at work. Most of those people that we're called to reach don't go to church. Even when the doors are open, they aren't here. Jesus didn't run into Matthew in the synagogue. Jesus ran into Matthew out in the world at his job. What an opportunity for us to get a new vision of what the church is supposed to be about. It's not about the building. Now, we need to be together. Make no buts about it. We need to be together. We are the body. We are strong when we're together. That's a good thing to be missing. And I know that there's so much loneliness out there. There's hurting. There's disconnect. We need to be together. I take nothing away from that. We need the fellowship. We need the word. We need to worship as one. Just like you, I'm desperate for that. But I don't think God has allowed us to have this season the last two months that he's had 
without a good reason. What's the target? Two months ago and today, what's the target? The target is Matthew. The target is your neighbor, your coworker, your friend. I've had a tough but good realization this week. While all I want to do is return to normal, right? That's what I think about all the time. I just want things to be normal, but I don't think we can. Somehow, before this happened, we were doing church nationwide. I'm talking about the American church. We were somehow doing church, but we were neglecting our mission. We had so much activity. We had so many programs, and yet we had across the country such little fruit. It broke my heart this week as I realized that I have grieved almost constantly the inability for us to gather together in our building. I mean, I've grieved that almost nonstop, but I haven't grieved hardly at all the fact that there are so many people in our community who don't know Jesus yet. I was distracted. I I thought being in here was the mission, and Jesus has had to remind me, no, there are Matthews out there. He is the mission. That's what our target is. Now, my goal in saying all of this isn't to make anyone feel guilty. I'm not trying to should any of us. Instead, I'm just trying to help us to realize who Jesus is and, and that his heart burns for the Matthews in our world. We have a couple of weeks before we're going to try to gather together again. And, and in that interlude, I want to challenge you in a couple of really important areas. These challenges are designed to help you and me get focused back on our target, okay? Number one, what is it that God has been trying to show you over these last eight or nine weeks? What is it that he has been trying to show you about how you were living life? He put a big stop to the world so that there is something we might see. What did he need to show you? Have you identified it yet? What did you need to see that only he could show you? I've asked the pastoral staff to start reflecting on that, and what they're already turning into me is amazing. There's a lot we needed to see that we wouldn't have seen had we not had this weird season. What does God need to show you? Don't miss it and just go back to normal, whatever normal is going to look like. Number two, in this interlude, what can you do to draw closer to God? Because that's the target. That's the blessing of this life. That's why you were made was to be close to Jesus. And I get that life is frustrating. And I get that many of us for the last eight or nine weeks have been distracted and we've ended up neglecting that relationship with Jesus. We've just got a little more time left in this weird season Let's all do our best to make spending time with him our priority. I want you coming back close to him because he's what it's all about. My third and final question is, who is God calling you to reach out to? Who are the Matthews that he has put on your path even during this season, okay? I want us to be evangelistic even though our doors aren't open yet, okay? Invite someone to come watch one of these worship services with you. Recommend the Daily Dose to a couple of friends and say what happens. Say, this has been a really tough season. I'm thankful that I can tune into God's word every day with a pastor, an elder, or a leader in our church. Um, That would be great. I can't wait to be back together. But no matter what, we have to remember what our target is. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. It wasn't the healthy who needed the doctor, but the sick. So let's make the most of the time that we have until we can gather together again. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, right now I repent of all the times I allowed myself to be distracted by those headline dodgeballs, and I forgot about what was really important, and I allowed myself to go into a place of fear, and I forgot how big you are and how powerful you are and how good you are, how loving and how in control you are. Heavenly Father, right now, what do you need to show me? What do I need to see before this season 
comes to an end. Lord, would you help me draw closer to you? Over the next few weeks, Father, would you help all of us draw closer to you? And then, Father, who are the Matthews in our world that you want us to reach out to? Would you reveal that to us? And now, finally, Lord, I I pray a blessing over everyone who is listening to this right now, that you'd fill them with your spirit, that you would sustain them, and that you would make them fruitful for you and for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. Hope to see you soon.